The objectives of the course is for us to provide this remote tactical support to organisations, so to get some productivity improvement. So we're here to provide you with that theory and give you some practical um, steps to actually making the change and making improvements. So we're not here just doing the theory. So we're here to help help you understand the theory and then apply it in practice. The fear that the reason for that is that at the end of the course, we want you to have had the experience of implementing it. So therefore, you can pick up the tools and techniques and carry on without us. So whilst we're here to support, it's the learning environment of of being able to try things out, get some feedback from I and the rest of, of the people on the course, and then uh, and then we'll do some learning together around that. So hopefully at the end of this, you'll have two things. You'll have some theory, you'll have had some evidence that it will work. And finally, you'll be able to take that and, and continue to use it. So the approach is we're going to do bite-sized chunks. So Neil and I, in a traditional way, rather than doing these things remotely, normally set up in businesses for a whole day and go through a whole set of techniques or up to a week. But um, doing these things remotely, it's a lot easier to do it in bite-sized chunks because we don't have to worry so much about the scheduling of, of getting everyone together. So we're going to take it in small bite-sized chunks. So we'll do some tools and techniques. We'll do some exercises, some templates and some user guides. And then at the end of each session, there'll be a sort of a call to action to see if you can utilize the things that we've taught in the session before we see you next time. So we're not expecting hours and hours of work between the sessions, but we'd like people to at least try the techniques and tools, because as I say, whilst we're together, we'll be able to share the learning between us. The final point is that the modules and sessions, they logically flow. So it's preferable if you're able to attend all, but we are recording them anyway. So if you can't attend, then obviously you can go and see the recording and get the material anyway. So five overall modules with a varying number of uh, sessions within them. So there's four modules. The first module, which is the two sessions we've got before Christmas, is overview of lean, its five key principles, and how they can be used to improve productivity. So this is the first of two sessions to explore. We then go to use those principles to actually identify areas for improvements. So where best do we put our efforts? We're then going to look at how actually we use some tools to improve the productivity in those critical operations. And once we've done that, we're going to teach you some techniques around visual management, um, plan, do, check, act, that helps keep that going and helps you manage change on an ongoing basis. I'm not going to go through all the technical terms that are in there because they're part of the sessions we have, but it's we're going to, in the first two sessions, give you an overview. The second session will be about set of sessions will be about identifying improvements. The third will be about making some changes and the fourth will be managing those changes and continuing the good work past the end of that one change. So here's a whole set of sessions. I'm not going to go through all of those now. Um, we will share the slides so people can can see these sessions as well. Anyway. So we're here today. I'm going to talk to you about the principles of lean and Neil's going to take you through some case studies about how it applies to horticulture. So we're going to talk, I'm going to talk briefly about the background and history of lean. It's certainly not going to be a history lesson. It's just what lessons were learned over history with the implementation of lean. I'll talk you through the lean principles. And as I say, Neil's then going to take you through the case studies and lessons learned. And then we're going to have a bit of a summary and a call to action. So at the end of the session, we're going to get you to start to think about what areas of the business would you like to start to apply some of these techniques. So I'm going to briefly talk about the background and the history of Lean. The reason to talk about this is because I think there's some interesting lessons that means that we are where we are today in terms of how is Lean is applied. So as you can see from my timeline along the bottom, these sort of things were, were way back into the 1850s in terms of techniques. So a gentleman called Eli Whitney 
first of all recognised that if he looked at the way things are made and made them in a different way, he could make them more efficient. So he did this on muskets. So you can tell that's a, a very, very long time ago, looking at how he can make interchangeable parts to make muskets more efficient. This was then picked up by someone called Frederick Taylor, who did Taylorism. Um, you might have heard of Taylorism. It's a, it's a scientific management of work. So he would observe people doing work. So at this time, I think it was pig iron shoveling that he spent ages watching people shoveling pig iron was his first study. And then he would write down and tell those people what are the best ways to do digging of pig iron. So he did that from a very much an observation, tell them what to do. So this then was picked up by Mr. Ford when he started to make the Model T. So the Model T was um, was famously the quote from Henry Ford was that you can have any colour you like as long as it's black. So he was able to take some of the techniques in terms of absolutely studying the work to say, how can we do it in the most efficient way? And he started mass production with the Model T. Um, and just to give an idea of the scale of what um, Henry Ford could do with this mass production of when we went into the war, um, I think the facilities and the techniques that Henry Ford was using is they were able to produce a bomber plane every hour in a, using the techniques of mass production. So big scalable things. Towards the, um, the end of the 1940s, what started to happen was, although mass production was very good at reducing costs, um, some of the so General Motors particularly then started to, to get a march onto his market because they could offer some customer variety. Along the bottom there, there's some other people that will mention Deming, Duran, Ishikawa and Crosby that were doing some other interesting things in the West around process control and quality. But what happened post-war when Japan didn't have any money and they had to become really efficient. They picked up a lot of these techniques from Henry Ford, but picked up some of the weaknesses. So as I said in that blue box across the top is what that first bit told us is that by studying the way work is done, we can improve it. So really having a deep understanding of the work, we can make it better. But what happened was that was a very much tell it to the people and it was very much on the basis of we'll only produce one type of car and not have any variety. So what happened after the war was, um, was Toyota particularly took some of those techniques, but really picked up on two things, which was actually the engagement of the people who do crucial and to get close to the customer. So to understand the customer. So previously with the people aspect of, of lean um, through the mass production, through the, the, the Henry Ford model, what they found is people hated it. So they had lots of problems with the unions, had lots of problems with people. So Japan decided that they would take some of those techniques, but they would really work on the engagement of people. So they, they talked about that, you know, their staff come to work, not just to hang their brains at the door, they come to bring that knowledge and that experience, and we should use that. And also to get really close to our customers so we can understand what the demand is and we can understand what they need. So these were crucial things in Lean. This is really converting that, that way of studying work into something that really helps people change. What happened was there's two people called Womack and Jones. I've put some links to some of these things at the end of the presentation who wrote two books. The first one was called The Machine That Changed the World and the second one was called Lean Thinking. And they studied how the Toyota and Japanese manufacturers are applying Lean um, and then documented that and created a set of lean principles. So that started to come into manufacturing in the 80s and 90s, probably when Neil and I first started doing it all of those years ago, started to happen in manufacturing in the UK, and then it started to get applied outside the sector. Finance um, picked it up quite quickly afterwards in some you know, big centres where they were doing transactional processes. And as Neil was saying over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, it's been started to be adopted more in agriculture and horticulture across the world. So the, the final point is that the principles that started in manufacturing and the tools, they apply to all sectors. So 
Neil and I work in a variety of different businesses. The tools and the techniques apply. We, can, we adapt them for the businesses, but they absolutely apply. So I'm going to take you through these five lean principles from Womack and Jones, and we'll probably get through those and then we'll have a five minute break. So the five principles are, the first one is about value. So principle one is being really clear about what is the value in the eyes of the customer. So really understanding what the customer wants. So an example I've got here, some strawberries in packaging with a label. Now I know that sounds really simple, but being really close to the customer and understanding what they require is really important in lean and is the first principle, a very customer driven approach. So specify the value in the eyes of the customer is the first principle. The second principle is understand the value stream. So this is from the start of the process to the point where something has been fulfilled and it's on the shelf and the customer can consume it. So that's all the steps right across the value stream. So don't just understand one part, understand the whole value stream. So from in this example, from a customer request to a request that's fulfilled. So second principle, understand the value stream. That's the process from end to end. But what we find within those processes are, we find that there's lots of things happening. So there's some of these value steps that are absolutely there for the customer. So that green step in the middle there where someone's picking the fruits is a value step. We'll come on to more of these in the next session about value and waste. And then the blue steps are where people are doing things that aren't particularly what the customer's paying for and what the customer wanted, moving it around, sorting it. Um, what other things we got on there? Um, checking the quality, et cetera, et cetera. So all different things are happening in the process. So what we tend to find is that there's these moments of value within a process with lots of other things going on and it goes round and round in circles. So it's generally not a linear process. It's a lot more complicated than just saying it's one step, we pick the fruit and it's on the customer shelf. So what Lean says is why can we not make those those processes flow. So how can we eliminate or reduce the activity that does not add value to the customer? And if we do that, the value will flow a lot better. So this is one of the key principles of when we look at process mapping, we'll look at how we do these in the coming sessions is, once we've defined the value and understood what the customer wants, which steps are absolutely adding the value? They're the things that the customer wants. They're the things that get done right first time. And they're often can see something actually changes or transforms. If we understand those, what we generally find there's a lot more steps doing other things that they're the things we want to try and reduce. So to remove this non-value adding activity to make sure the value flows. The fourth principle is um, ensuring that we make things to the customer's requirements. We don't make too many, we don't make too little, and we try and make them when they want them. And this is called pull. And this, in terms of traditional manufacturing, is about the customer pulling the product through the process. So they pull towards the customer. So rather than we start at the other end of the process and make lots and then push it down the process, we pull it towards the customer. For our sakes, our understanding is, are we ensuring that what we're making is synchronized with what the customer requires, when they want it, how much? Um, so we're not doing too much, too late or too early, or not enough too late or too early. Quickly, the final of the, the five lean principles is perfection. So this is not about the word perfection itself. It's um, it is the continuous improvement towards perfection. So it's about getting better day by day, making small steps towards bigger change. So the, the goal is perfection, but really we think of it as in terms of continuous improvement rather than we think about it's all going to be perfect. It's how we can make small incremental changes to perfection.
So five lean principles. So I will go through them again. Yeah, um, I think we acknowledge the fact that the fourth principle, pull, that's going to be a little bit more dependent on your on your side of business and when the crop's ready. So there's there's a little bit of push because when the crop's ready, the crop's ready, and you've got to you've got to react to that and you've got to pick it. Um, but then we we start thinking about from that stage, from on the, once the the stock is picked, it's the how do you pull it through the pack house. Um, so what we've done over the years is we've recognised that each sector that we apply these principles to, we've had to modify them slightly. Uh, and that's one example of uh, I've actually had to modify the principle to just take into the fact that when you've got a live crop, there is going to be an element of push, which is determined from when the, the crop's ready. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. So I'm going to quickly go through these again. And then I think what we might do is then just actually probably take a break and then we'll do the case studies and, and so forth. So. I'll go through them again. Five lean principles. Specify value in the eyes of the customer. So the first, first principle is value. So making sure we understand exactly what the customer wants. Understand the value stream is about understanding all of the steps that get us from the point of the start to the point that we actually have something at the customer's premises. If we look at those processes, what we want to do is reduce or remove the activity that is non-value adding, those steps that aren't directly creating the value, so the process flows better. As Neil mentioned about pull, it's about as best as we can within the process that you have about ensuring that we're making to customer demand. So as Neil says, you might pull it through the pack house, but accept that it's pushed towards that. But I think it's the important thing is, is, is how can you, as best you can, synchronise with the customer requirement as best you can. And perfection, I think the word perfection is probably not the right word. It's more about continuous improvement for us. Also, a quick, a quick thing about the word lean. I don't know about Neil, but I'm not, I'm not massively a fan of the word lean because it kind of implies less, implies less of everything. And most people, we get lots of comments when we train people or we talk to businesses. Is, is this about getting rid of, rid of people? Is this about doing less? But actually, in, in lots of cases, it's about doing more. It's about more engagement with your staff. It's about a better engagement with your customer rather than lots of less words. So we'll continue to use lean because I think it's a useful term to use. But I just thought I'd flag that it's probably term wise. It, it infers something that people in the business might react to in a certain way. So it's worth just thinking as you start to communicate your improvements and talk to people about it. Of, of how you do that. So you ensure that people don't infer from the word lean that it means, you know, I think being blunt about it, sometimes people think, oh, it just means we're gonna get rid of people, which as Neil explains, what, what we mostly find is that businesses through applying lead and becoming more efficient can grow their business without having to take on more people or they can, or they can you know, do, they can diversify, they can do more. So it's, it's, it's that type of thing rather than we work on projects where we reduce headcounts. Cool. So, I, Neil, I'll hand over to you. I just wanted to check if there was any questions before we did that about the either the course or the um, or the principles. Any questions from anyone before we carry on? I'll take that as a no. I will hand over to Neil so you should see the slides again Neil yeah got them Brilliant. okay and, and I'm going to click through them aren't I yeah please okay uh hopefully everyone can hear me okay um yeah just wanted to give you some examples of where lean's been applied before in the past and, and hopefully these are examples that you'll be able to relate to because they're all ones that we've uh, we've picked and we've chosen from horticulture and agriculture. So uh, a typical project might be when you start mapping out uh, the value stream and you start looking at where the bottlenecks are that are stopping the flow of the product and the flow of the value. One of the things that you might come across is that you've got some uh, machinery setup times in there that's causing problems. So particularly in a pack house, or it could be a potting machine, or it could be a transplanting machine. 
um, so or a piece any any piece of capital equipment and what you may find is that it's taken a long time to set that machine up uh, and in particular if you you've got lots of variety so you like say for example a label change on a printer and you're running lots of different types of packaging and lots of types of different labels what you might find is you're spending more and more time setting up the equipment than what you are actually when you're running the line and in particular if you've got uh, a large number of people that are actually um, on those packing lines so you may find that those packing lines are down and you've got a, a group of people that are stood there waiting for the machine to be set up so that might be a typical one where you map out what's involved in setting up that machine how can you make it as simple and as easy as possible to reduce down those setup times so that might be a typical one uh, the other one uh, could be looking at the lead time to dispatch the product so when you've got the the product itself down in the packing warehouse uh, how do you actually get that product the, the customer order how do you actually pack the products as quickly and as efficiently as possible and how do you get it onto the back of the lorry so that it's ready to be dispatched to the customer so looking at all the uh, the points of the process that are involved in that particular activity and thinking through where do we lose time what is it that we can do to simplify and improve this and make this as quick as possible I think all of you have, have picked out seasonality and when we were talking to you about how many people that you've got in the business and that difference between the core group of people that you employ and the peak number of people that you employ, there's quite a significant chunk and difference between the two. So, you know, thinking about how do we cope with those seasonal spikes in output? And it might well be that you know, the majority of your activity occurs within a, a very small three month win window. So how do you ramp up very quickly? And then once you've uh, you've gone through the peak, how do you ramp down very quickly? So we, we've already talked about uh, training people up, very trying to get people up to skill and up to speed. So we've done quite a bit of work with companies this year on, first of all, simplifying the process and making it as easy as possible so people can be trained uh, and can get up to speed. But then also, how do we document that? So making little YouTube videos. Uh, we, we, there's a technique that will take you through which is all about standard operations which is how you document how to do a particular process and these little YouTube videos are being used to train people up to get them up to speed particularly if language is a barrier so this is a really good way of, of passing on all those skills that are necessary to get people to work at the quickest speed they can do within the shortest time period to get you up that learning curve so you can you can satisfy the peak demands so that's another typical project. Visual management boards. So one of the techniques that we'll take you through is how do you improve the communications within the business? Uh, it might well be that you've uh, you've got several different functions within the with, within the business itself. Typical one is a breakdown in communications between the pack house and the pickers. So the pickers are, uh, are picking things that's not the right quality. Uh, they're trying to put too much product into the packaging. Uh, and picking two bigger products, say for example, and that's causing problems in the pack house where they're uh, they're trying to squeeze two bigger products or too much products into a uh, wrong quality product. They're having to spend a lot of time sorting it through. So uh, what we do is we use visual management boards as a way of encouraging the communication between the pickers and the pack house. So in this one example I'm thinking of now, the pack house could feed back if there were any quality issues, what those issues were to the pickers so that we could put the emphasis and we could try and get the quality right in the field rather than trying to sort the quality uh, once it had been brought back to the pack house. Well, this one about need to introduce new service or product offerings more frequently. Uh, again, uh, a lot of UK growers, what they've specialised on is the variety of what they offer. So uh, I remember doing work for one tomato producer and I think they had something like 32 different variants of tomatoes. Um, and what they, they'd specialised in, they were supplying to the sort of like the top end, the high end supermarkets. And what they'd specialised in was introducing new varieties. And the, the business would run perfectly well when it was working on mature products. But every time they introduced new products, the learning curve and getting everyone used to how to grow this new product and how to handle it, that's where efficiencies uh, started to decrease. So we actually mapped out what is the process for introducing new products? How do we make sure everyone's aware of how to grow this product efficiently? 
and effectively. And then how do how does everyone handle this product when it's going through the normal process flow? So we spent quite a bit of time documenting that down. And it was little things, little details, making sure that the labels they were going to use on the packaging were agreed and they were set up on the printers so they could uh, reduce down any time, set up times on the printers again with those new products. Particularly in, in pack houses uh, where space is a premium, uh, a lot of businesses we've worked in, they've grown quite rapidly over the years. They're still working in the original pack houses that they, they had when they set the business up and they're starting to run out of space within those pack houses. So spending quite a bit of time thinking about workplace organisation, which is another one of the techniques that will take you through. Uh, how do you organise yourselves as efficiently as possible and how do you get the most out, out of every little bit of space that you've got to fit available in the pack house? so that you can get more product through without having to spend money on expanding the pack house itself. So uh, that's where you've got those space constraints. Technique that will show your workplace organisation is a great way of, uh, of getting as much out of the pack house as you possibly can do. Reducing stock and improving cash flow. Uh, so we look at one of the ways that will take you through is the waste of inventory. Uh, that might be where you've got too much packaging on site, you've got too much uh, product uh, associated with the uh, the packaging of the materials uh, the handling of the materials and that's that's taking up space you know what can we do to reduce down the amount of stock you've got uh, and move that stock through the organization as quick as possible so we can improve the cash flow so um, there's a benefit uh, that we look at is by getting the product through the business as quick as possible what that enables is the uh, the cash flow to come back into the business again and then uh, the last one on here, skill shortages. We, we talked about this earlier. It's been a common problem for the last couple of years, at least. Uh, trying to get the right skills into the business, being able to recruit the right people, um, being able to keep those people in the business uh, is absolutely crucial. So thinking through, you know, what are all the, the things that take away cap capacity? You know, where are we losing time? And by applying these lean principles and reducing down all those time losses, using that to free up capacity so we can get the best out of the skills that we have actually got on site within the business itself. So they're, they're just some typical examples of the kind of things that will uh, will get you to think about when it comes to uh, giving you the hands-on experience of applying lean within your own businesses. So going through, David, next slide, just going through some more of the case studies. So these are some of the savings that we achieved on, on Smart Hort 1, which was the initial group of companies that we put through uh, the lean training. Uh, and this is the, the savings that they achieved, the yearly savings. So it was simple things. And what I'll do in a minute, I'll take you through some of these case studies in a lot more detail. Uh, but what we always try and do whenever it comes to a lean project, what we do is we, we calculate how much time is lost, work out how many times you carry out the operation a year, uh, and what your labour rate is, so we can actually start to calculate uh, what is the yearly, the potential yearly savings of doing these productivity improvements within the business. And we've put the cost of the, of the project, and as you can see from that column on the right hand side, the costs are fairly minimal, they're fairly small, because uh, what we always try to focus in on and prioritise on, and this is one of the techniques again that we'll show you, we get you to prioritise the, the ideas and the improvement projects that generate the biggest savings with the least amount of cost and investment uh, and in particular time so that way you can get the savings um, in a shorter lead time as possible because uh, quite often um, we're working with organizations and uh, once they come out of peak there's not actually that long a time before they go back into the next peak again so being able to do improvements within that short time frame is uh, is again is a is a key element of, of doing the improvement projects and a lot of businesses, you know, they don't have big, uh, large amounts of capital investment available to spend on robotics and automation. So, again, using the using the, uh, the prioritisation to identify which the ones that give the biggest savings with a small amount of investment just allows us to get these improvements going uh, so that hopefully we can save some money within the short term tactical timescales. So I'll just moving down, David, next slide.
Sorry, David, just want to go back up and just go for that small oil object. Because this is, I think we talked about this before. This is really what we were trying to achieve. And this is really the same as what we're trying to achieve again. So it's this idea of uh, giving you some live case studies, um, you know, talking through the experience that we've had previously, getting you guys to talk about what experience you're having. It's this combination of theory and practical. It's no point of just talking you through the theory. You know, you only really know you know a topic is when you actually start trying to apply it and apply it in a live environment. So we're, we're going to make sure it's very practical. And as David mentioned, you know, the aim of us doing this is to make sure that you, you carry on doing it into the future. So once the course is finished, you've got the confidence to actually keep it going. You know, it becomes a part of your normal business cycle to identify ways of improving business. And hopefully by doing this, and I think it, it was one of the uh, the things that somebody mentioned right at the start of what they want to get out of this. Hopefully by doing it, it improves the work environment and the, and the morale of the individuals. It's a way of motivating people. So by getting people more involved in identifying where the issues are and then thinking about ways of actually improving those problems and eliminating those problems, hopefully that's a really good way of getting more and more people uh, not only involved, but also motivated to do more improvements. So hopefully by doing that, it actually improves the work environment for the individuals. And, and not only that, the, the types of issues that we're focusing on are the ones that really cause a little bit of hassle um, and a bit of grief for the individuals that work within the, the operation. Uh, most people want to come in and just want to do a good job. And if there's something stopping you doing that because you can't find the right piece of tooling or you haven't got access to the right amount of information, that can be very frustrating. So by eliminating these problems, hopefully what it starts to do as well is make, make the environment far more enjoyable for the people that work within the business. David, next slide, please. So these are just uh, some examples of, of case studies. So this one was in uh, a packing operation. Uh, so probably like very similar to a lot of your businesses, the the fruit, the products, the plants um, are grown in a, in a separate sites, uh, multiple sites uh, spread across quite large geographical areas. They're collected, they're picked, they're brought to a pack house. And then what you're going to do then is put the uh, the product into the final pack. Um, and in the pack house, when we started to analyse the, the process flow and, and analyse the value streams, we found these problems on the left hand side. So people were walking around trying to find the packaging that they needed. There was lots and lots of different packs. Uh, it was a multiple pick. So there were similar products, uh, lots of different products going into the packaging. So people were constantly looking for the right types of packaging. You also had forklifts moving around the area, moving bulk packaging. So people and forklifts, not a great combination, uh, particularly when you've not got a great deal of space available in a pack house. So that was that was an issue in itself. And uh, because people were spending time looking for packaging and this was a moving production line, they were having lots of downtime because they were getting queues of products on the conveyor belts and they were having to stop the lines to clear the line down and through, and when we actually look, looked into the reasons behind that, what we actually found, it was down to the fact that people were searching for the packaging that they needed. And then also it was a poor changeover. So when they were swapping from uh, product types, there was a lot of people hanging around whilst they set the lines up and they, they flushed out the old products and brought the new product down to go through the packing lines. So that was the, the things that we focused in on. That was the achievements. On the right hand side, so probably the main one on there is this 9% labour saving. So that's across the full business. Uh, there's over 100 people working in the business. So 9% labour saving across the whole business was quite significant. I think it was something like about £140,000. Uh, it made to the bottom line additional uh, additional contributions. So some quite significant um, savings with a very small investment into the actual packing lines themselves. The other thing that it found it allowed them to do was it allowed them to understand more what their core labour requirements were. So uh, as, as quite a few of you have mentioned, the, the difference between your core and your peak can be quite a large difference. And that can cause problems when you, you're recruiting every year uh, and you're recruiting for your peak. So by doing this, it allowed us to actually calculate what the core requirement was of labour. and We managed to increase the size of the core crew 
um, which then reduced down the difference of the number of people that, that we had to recruit. And it also meant that we had the core skills within the business for the for the next year. So that was one element, an additional element that came out of this. David, you just want to click down. And these are just some of the techniques that we used. Uh, so we'll take you through string diagrams. We have a layout and you draw a, a string to represent where the movements. Uh, we use a technique called waste walks and process mapping to understand the detail of what's going on within the process uh, and how to reduce down the amount of waste. And then we use this technique, which is all about uh, improving the organisation of the area. So uh, how can we best organise the pack house or the whichever area it is that's time con constrained? How can we best organise that to get the most out of it? So that's just some of the techniques that we used and what we're going to take you through as part of the course to achieve the, uh, the achievements on this slide. And then I think the next slide is a picture of the pack house itself. Yeah. So basically, the picture on the right hand side is what we ended up with. Um, you can see the packaging there on the uh, waiting next to the pack benches. So on the right hand side of the blue line, you can see there's there's a bench, which is what they do the packing on. And then you've got packaging uh, just above that. And they've got different sizes of packaging. So what we actually spent quite a bit of time doing was designing these workbenches so that they had everything that they needed to carry out the, the different uh, types of packs actually on the bench so they could stay on the benches and they walk working walking away from the packing area to get the package in that are required there's a, a blue line that you can see a blue conveyor belt that you can see sloping down um, we position that closer to the bench as well there's quite a bit of distance at one point they're having to spend quite a bit of time and it, and it didn't look that significant when you looked at it but then when you multiply that up by the number of times they were picking products off the benches and then putting it onto the blue conveyor and you multiply the number of times they were actually doing that activity it soon mounted up uh, to the point where uh, moving the blue line closer allowed them to, to save quite a bit of time on that element of the process okay david next slide please the two is sticking so this was in a propagator where they take cuttings and they put them into trays um, the problems that they had uh, as again, I guess most of you had this problem. Uh, they had a, they had operators that were coming in, and they had a, a massive variety of ranges of the rates at which they could pick at or stick at. So you had some people who were very very quick, and you had some people who were very slow, and then you had a group of people that sat in the middle of those two ranges. So we were looking at um, what are the differences? Why do we have some people that can pick very quickly, and why do we have some people that uh, it took quite a while for them to pick? Um, the rates. So we're looking at the differences between the quick and the slow individuals. The amount of travelling that was involved in the operation, uh, in particular, you can see on the key achievements there, we uh, we actually justified and purchased a fridge so they could actually keep the cuttings closer to the where they were working. Uh, previously, we were having to walk the full length of the nursery itself to a very large fridge to get the cuttings. Um, and what we we actually persuaded the management team to do was to actually look at getting a smaller fridge so they could locate that closer to the lines just to reduce down the amount of traveling and that allowed the supervisor to spend more time actually on the lines training the individuals particularly new starters so new people who come into the business making sure that they could get them up to rate as quick as possible uh, this was the other one as well that i mentioned about doing uh, little videos so they actually uh, started to produce videos uh, which they can then use to train people again in the future. And uh, just by doing these simple improvements, by looking at the fridge, by looking at the reducing of the travelling, by improving the ergonomics and the arrangements of the uh, the packaging material again around the actual operator, uh, that identified somewhere between a 5 and 15% improvement in productivity. So this theme of, of small, simple improvements that actually generate some quite significant contributions when you start to multiply up the number of times to do it per year is, is a common theme within Lean. And David, I think we've got the, the types of stuff that we use. These are some of the examples of the uh, the techniques that we use that are going to come up on screen now. So we'll always get you through a cost benefit analysis. So we'll calculate how much time you're losing, how much money we have to spend to save the improvements. 
Um, we'll show you how to use a technique called plan, do, check out, which is a way of, of trialing different ideas that people have got. So we, we always encourage the people that work within the process to come up with new ideas. And what we'll, we'll show you is how we can use a technique called plan, do, check out to actually run these trials and prove these ideas uh, before you actually start investing in, uh, in bigger improvements. This idea of visual management. So how do you make things as visual as possible? So rather than just being word of mouth and trying to communicate best practice through word of mouth, how can you make things as visual? So using pictures, using videos, uh, writing down the process step by step. That's another thing we'll look at on that side of things. Uh, the activity sampling. So David will take you through on one of his courses. He'll take you through how you, uh, you do an activity sample. So you videotape a quicker operator and you videotape a slower operator and you compare the styles and you compare the way they carry out the task. And then use that then as a way of identifying how can you improve the rate of those people that are working at a slower rate. So that's again some of the techniques set against a case study. This one, this time it was propagation. OK, David. And then this is that video I just mentioned. So what we did is we videotaped four operators, all of varying speeds. And you can see the operator top left, they achieved uh, 23. Um, operations within a, I think it was something like about 10 minutes. It was a, a very short video. It's quite a quick activity where you're actually sticking cuttings into a tray. So they, they achieved 23 operations. And in the same time, the operator down the bottom right only achieved 11. And what we were trying to do was to analyze what the difference was in, in performance. And then what we're always trying to do is you can see on the text, we're trying to get the slower pickers to move towards the uh, the, the medium, uh, or the, the medium quartile. So we're trying to shift up, get some of the slower pickers to work uh, slightly quicker. Um, and then obviously trying to identify ways the ones that are working at the quickest rates, you know, how can they push their, their performance even further? Uh, so by videotaping it, by breaking down the movements, looking at where they've set up the activity, comparing the differences, and then showing that to the individuals so that they can understand the differences in the techniques. That's one great way of training people up and getting people up to speed very, very, very quickly. Thanks, David. Next one, this is uh, a common one, I guess, to you guys. Um, where people, you can't find brooms, you can't find cleaning equipment within the uh, within the growing areas, say, for example, you can't find the tooling that you need to do a particular job. Uh, and you've got lots of time in terms of people walking around trying to find the uh, the cleaning equipment or even worse, people just give up. They just don't even bother cleaning up the area because they can't find the uh, the clean equipment that they need. So what happens is the area starts to become very, very untidy. And then eventually at some point you have to stop the operation and you have a great big tidy up. We have everybody involved in that particular activity. So this is using the visual management technique. All we did is created some cleaning stations. We have one of these in each of the, uh, the glass houses. We colour coordinated all the items that they needed. So there was a different colour for each of the glass houses. So if, uh, if anything did go missing, uh, you knew where it originated from. And the idea is, is that uh, there's no excuses, basically. People can find the equipment that they need to do a tidy up at the end of each shift. They can find it quickly. They can get the job done. And hopefully by doing that, it keeps the area looking as neat and as tidy as you possibly can find it. So this is that technique we talked about earlier, workplace organisation, or in terms it's called 5S. So this is again a good example of, uh, of workplace organisation and how it can be used to improve the general cleanliness of a glass house. So some of, again, some of the techniques we'll use, we we'll use a technique called problem resolution, which is getting you to identify all the little problems that keep occurring. You know, these are the kind of problems that occur more or less every day, um, and they almost become the part of the normal way of working. And really what we're doing with this, uh, this technique called problem resolution, is just getting you to say, right, let, how can we make sure this problem never reoccurs again? How can we make sure that we're not just doing the same solutions and the same workarounds week on, week out. Uh, and then I mentioned about 5S and workplace organisations. That's the other techniques that we'll take you through 
that link into that cleanliness. David, next slide. And then just another example. So this one was uh, in a farm uh, maintenance area. So the picture on the left-hand side shows a picture of what it was like when you walked in there. Um, the example was uh, we were looking at where somebody was, had to do some maintenance on a tractor. Uh, they picked up the extension cable for the power tool that they needed to do the, the work. I think they needed to get access to a grinding tool. Um, they actually went down, found the, uh, the tractor in the fields. Unfortunately, somebody had cut the, uh, the, the plug off the extension cable. So it was 45 minutes lost uh, driving down to where they had to do the repair work on the tractor. And another 45 minutes dr lost driving back to get a replacement. Um, and, in, and on the right hand side, you can see the kind of things that we're trying to achieve. This is from a, a manufacturing company that we've done work with. And it's this, uh, this idea of a place for everything and everything in its place. So the tool and the equipment that you need to do the job is displayed in such a way that you can see if it's not fit for purpose. You can see instantly if it's missing. And before you even start the job, uh, you can make sure you've got everything that you need to actually complete it in a timely manner. So uh, another way of, of saving little, bit, little bits of time that actually uh, add up to being quite significant chunks of time. Thanks, David. So similar sort of things uh, in terms of looking at the distances travelled. So this one was uh, fruit picking. Uh, it was the amount of time spent on when the fruit had been picked, actually taking it to the weigh stations. Uh, and there was that distance was quite excessive. Uh, and when you actually added it up across a full time period, I think each picker was walking something like 14 kilometres a day. So there was a, a big distance travelled, accumulated distance travelled. And there was also an issue whereby the pickers didn't have enough buckets. So they were constantly coming back to the weigh stations to get additional buckets that they required. Uh, and also there was an issue whereby, especially with new workers, that were coming into the business, they couldn't find the roles that they had been allocated. There was no numbering on the roles. So they were losing time walking around trying to find the roles uh, that they had been allocated to actually do their pick that particular day. So uh, what we basically did is we actually lost some of the growing space and located some of the way stations closer to where the picking was actually taking place. So it was positioned outside of the polytunnel and what we did is we created some space inside the polytunnel to reduce down the distance travelled. So that had quite a big improvement on improving productivity. And you can see down the bottom there, um, it saves something like 20 minutes per picker per day. But then when you've got 200 pickers and you multiply that up, it works out to £80,000 a year was being lost in terms of time. So um, the, the investments on losing a little bit of growing space and relocating those way stations closer more than paid itself back um, over a year. Thanks, David. And then we're just looking again, activity sampling, looking at why some pickers pick well and pick very quickly and some pickers don't work to speed. Uh, so what we did is we, we analysed using that activity sampling and what we found is it's, it's not that the fact that slow pickers are actually picking slower, it's simply down to the fact that they're, they're not as well organised. In this particular example, they weren't as well organised as the quicker pickers. Uh, they didn't have all the packaging and materials available and around them when they were actually carrying out the activities. So they were losing lots of time walking backwards and forwards to get the equipment and the materials that they needed. So really, what a, a lot of instances, it was making sure there was a making sure they need to recognise that they need to be as organised as they possibly can do before they actually start the picking operation. Thanks, David. This one is propagation. So this one where they're having to carry out a rework activity. So basically the dibbing operation is where they put holes into trays before they put the cuttings in. Uh, the machine they had uh, didn't always quite put the holes down as, as well as it should have done. Uh, so what they've done is they've just created a jig uh, so that it makes it easier to put the holes into the trays. So a very, very simple investment, uh, which saves something like 30 seconds per tray. So this was an idea that somebody had that was doing the waste walk and the process mapping. So we're always trying to encourage people that work within the process because they work closest to it 
and they're more aware of what the issues are to come up with the ideas of what they could actually do to improve the process itself. So a simple improvement that actually made quite a big difference to the overall operational performance of this process. Next slide, David. This one was all again about uh, creating a bit of space. So this was the scanning stations that they had. Uh, again, too big a distance between the scanning stations and where they were actually picking the fruit. So we um, we moved the scanning stations closer to the actual pick face itself, uh, and that reduced down the distance travelled, but increased the, the amount of kilograms per hour that the pickers were achieving. So uh, just basically increasing the capacity they could get out of the skills that they had within the business, which is this this key element that we keep referring back to, which is getting the best out of the skills that you have got within the business itself. Next slide, David. And this just shows a picture of where they've uh, they've lost a bit of growing space. Uh, they haven't lost a great deal, um, but it wasn't being fully utilised anyway. Uh, and this is where they've put the scanning areas close to the pick areas, where before they were a lot further away, um, right at the end of one of the runs of the polytunnels itself. Next slide, David. Same thing in some respects, but this one's looking at the grading out of fruit and what they actually found from when they were actually doing the waste walk itself, that too much fruit was being graded out in the... Um, they were applying too stringent a quality procedure to it and they were grading out too much fruit. And when we actually got the pack house involved, they actually realised there was a 7% a saving they could achieve just by recalibrating the pickers and making sure they were fully aware of what the correct quality standards were. Um, a bit unusual, this one. Normally, it's the other way around. Normally, they're not grading out enough fruit. Um, and what that leads to is poor quality getting to the pack house. And then the pack house have to do that sorting operation. But it, it illustrates a similar problem, which is you've got a breakdown in communications between the pickers and the pack house. And I'm not fully understanding what the requ right requirements are for a right quality specification. Um, so it's just improving that communication and doing some simple problem solving to help overcome those particular issues. Okay, David. And that's where, again, we'll use these techniques of, of structured problem solving. And this is a classic visual management board where you've got all the information that's needed by uh, each of the operations and up, is up on display. So that might be the quality and feedback from the pack house on issues. And then the, it might have pick rates that are up there as well. So uh, in, in quite a few organisations, we've got them to display what the pick rates that the pickers have achieved and then use that then to get the group together, to brief everybody so everyone understands what the issues are within the business. But then more importantly, to get feedback from those individuals, what problems they're having, so that they can then drive improvement activity. And, and that's where we start using these lean tool te tools and techniques to drive out those inefficiencies. So this is your way of keeping it going. This is a way of getting everybody involved and hopefully improving morale of those individuals by getting them more involved in the operation itself. So this is what we mean by a visual management board. Thanks, David. So just summarising, hopefully it gets you to see that we're focusing on quick paybacks. So big payback, big uh, savings, relatively small investments. Um, getting you to think about how you actually go about doing the analysis. So how do you identify um, what improvements can take place? And you might have to carve out a little bit of time to start off with. You might have to think about how you're planning the time to analyse the process itself. So rather than focusing on the task all the time, um, how do you, do, you, do you create two hours, a two hour window so you can sit back and look and analyse the process itself? How do you get people involved? in doing the improvements so getting them to feedback what issues that they're having getting them to participate in the waste walks and the process mapping activities uh, so that they can have their say as to what the issues are and what their ideas are for doing improvement making sure that the management team are bought into it so the management team are willing to back the improvements that come out of it and uh, again you'll see a, a, another key theme that you'll see within lean this uh, plan do check act this idea of trialing ideas. So rather than just writing something off um, as it won't work, we've tried it before in the past, just getting people to think through, you know, how do we set up a trial? How do we prove whether this works or not? 
Um, and if it doesn't work, then we haven't really lost anything because all it was was a trial. But if it does work, how do we then get this idea and then roll this out across the rest of the operation? So we'll, uh, part of the course will get you thinking through how do you trial these ideas that are coming out of the improvement activities and the analysis that you're doing. So that's just some of the lessons learned and a bit of a summary of, uh, of what we've been through. Has anyone got any questions, anything that we've covered as part of those case studies? Is, has anyone got any questions or anything that we went through? Five S audit. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. So that is uh, one of the techniques we'll show you. You actually go into an area where you give you a set of questions and they, they fall under five categories. So sort, for example, which is the first category is how well organised and how easy can you access the tooling that you need to get access to to do the job? Um, how much um, waste product is on the floor, for example? Are the corridors blocked? Are the gangways blocked? Is there any blockages to access to key areas uh, of the operation itself? So it's just an audit that we use to get you to go down into your area to analyse and identify where the issues are, and you get a score at the end of it. It gives you a score, and based on that score, it starts to identify where you need to carry out improvements. And it also then gives you a metric and a measure to see whether you're improving. So the idea is you do the 5S audit every month, and as you start to do the improvements, you should start to see your score increasing. So it gives you an idea of whether you're improving the operation as well. Is that okay, Luke? Does that give you an overview of, of what we mean by 5S audits? Yeah, brilliant. NVA is non-value add. So what non-value add means is uh, a waste. So value add is something the customer is willing to pay for. So as David mentioned, uh, putting the packaging in the, sorry, putting the fruit in the final pack uh, or putting the plants that you've that you've lifted into the onto the Danish trolley that you're going to send to the customer, there are things that add value. A classic non-value add might be the amount of time you spend walking around trying to find a Danish trolley or trying to find um, incorrect plants because what, what's been given to you by the pickers is not the correct quality or there's missing plants and therefore you've got to request additional plants to make up that particular trolley. They're all what we classify as non-value add or waste within the process and that's what we're trying to eliminate with Lean. Dan's got a question. We've tried to take quite a wide selection of case studies. Um, so hopefully from the case studies, there's something relevant to your particular businesses as well. So um, hopefully there's, there's things in there that uh, help you. Thanks, Dan. There's things in there that help you relate the theory to the practical. Because um, that, that's always the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge with any course that you go on is how does it work in my business? So we, we've tried to take quite a wide selection of different uh, different types of sectors and uh, processes. So hopefully we'll link some of the theory uh, to your own particular environments. So just got a few more slides and then we're going to sort of do the, the activity for the session. I, I am off mute, aren't I? You can hear me. I'll get Neil just to confirm that. I'm, yeah, good. Thank you. Um, some, just some useful links. Um, I thought there were some useful things that if you're into having a look at reading things particular, um, obviously the Smart Hort sites, um, there's lots of information there about the case studies and the work that's been done that we've been involved in and elsewhere. Um, if you want to read about lean, um, lean thinking is a good, good place to start. Um, also, Ben Hartman's information about the lean farm, uh, certainly we've found there's some useful insights and some useful case studies, et cetera. So if you were the sort of type and you maybe wanted to buy a couple of books as you're going through this course, I'd certainly suggest Lean Thinking and the Lean Farm. Um, and there's another interesting article about lean in Swedish agriculture, um, which again, I've put the link for in the slides. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd say if you're interested in picking up some of the knowledge, Lean Thinking and the Lean Farm would be very useful. Um, there's also the Lean Toolbox as well, which is another very useful book as well. 
Any others, Neil, that you can spring to mind? I was trying to think of just a few useful ones at this stage. No, I think they're, they're good ones to get started on, particularly that clear bottom form. Um, that's a really good, interesting sort of like read, basically. So, yeah, have a look at those. As we do each uh, session, we'll, um, we'll we'll put some, if we found anything in our own travels, we'll put those links up as well. So we'll keep updating with, you, with the latest thinking and the latest stuff that we're coming across. Yeah, I, th I think starting with the lean farm is not a bad one, is it? Lean thinking is a bit dry. It's yeah. Bit, yeah. So the lean farm might be a good one that's applicable. It's, it covers the principles, etc. So that's good. So look, we've, we've done the, the majority of the content. So I just wanted to quickly just go back through that. And then we've got a bit of a, a sort of exercise for us to finish and for us to think about before the next session. So just in very much in terms of, of, of the summary of what we've done. So if you remember, I think the interesting things about the history is that you know by by studying the work this is what we learned through the history of lean by studying the work engaging the, with the people who do it and being close to the customer requirements is what toyota really um sort of embodied which was picked up by <coughs> womack and jones and which has been the principles that have been applied so we talked about those lean principles i've put them on the right again being very clear about value what's the value in the eyes of the customer understanding how that value gets actually um applied from the point of um, the start of the work to the point right at the end so right across that value stream we should be looking we talked about non-value add so all those things all those steps all those activities some of the things that um, neil talked about during the case studies that don't add value how can we reduce or remove some of those and the work will flow better and the value will flow better towards the customer ensure that the processes make when the customer asks for it or pulls it. And I think as Neil pointed out within um, horticulture and agriculture, we realise that's um, difficult to do in terms of a pull, but certainly from a point of view of synchronising as best you can with the customer's requirements in terms of times and quantity. And finally, that attain perfection by continually improving towards it. Uh, they're the five lean principles. They can be applied to a variety of products and often you know, making improvements again, which hopefully through the case study we've seen, it's not a huge investment, can take a bit of time to do it, but that time is is often working and talking with people, analysing your processes, engaging the staff, make sure that you've got top down commitments. And as Neil says, one of the things is, is the beauty of these things, because there's often low capital investment, is often we can just try things. And we learn far more by trying and testing than we do spending 20 hours in a workshop trying to work out the best way of doing it. So we always encourage um, people to think about, well, at, at what point can I get to a point where I can give something a go? Because if I give it a go, I'll be able to learn lots more. So the next session, we're going to talk about how to target areas for improvement and identifying these things that we talked about non-value add. But what we wanted you to do a bit today, so we've got a little bit of time now, and um, we probably won't be able to get too much of it done, is really to think about what process or area within your business do you think would benefit from a lean implementation? So this is some initial thinking. So we're not trying to tie people down to this is the final answer. Um, we're trying to get you just to think about as from the case studies, from the lean principles, what area do you think we should start looking at? And I've got some selection criteria which which will help. And once I finish talking, I will put this into the chat so you've got them. So these aren't strict rules. These are just ideas about where generally um, are good areas to select. So clearly the first one being that labor and cost content if there's a significant proportion of your workforce to cost in this area then it's more likely to be a place where you're able to get significant gains so if there's more labor and more cost the gains you're likely to achieve are more significant we often find that where there's quality issues in combination with that is another good area to look at in terms of tasks and volumes Again, these aren't hard and fast rules, but generally repetitive tasks, consistent volumes, high consistent volumes are, are better. Um, number five is about your influence. 
So we tend to encourage people to try and improve the areas they work within rather than improve other people's. So again, thinking about, is this a primary area of worker responsibility? Is this an area you have control of? You work within the people who work within it work for you is again, a good, a good thing. And the final one is about ease of implementation. So this is just a barometer of in the first instance, how difficult do we think it is to make the change? I don't think we'd suggest that you go for the hardest area on this course. I think that the thing for us is this, you know, we want to demonstrate and we want you to learn how to make an improvement. And sometimes picking the most difficult thing to start with can sort of prevent that. So we'd rather think about what sort of areas are likely to deliver some changes in the first instance. So what I thought we would do, and we've got a little bit of time, and might, we might just give you five minutes, just to have a quick think about that um, before we finish. And I will take some notes about what areas people think. So just to use those criteria, very simple, just to think about for your business, what are the types of areas that you think you might start to look at in terms of implementing lean as a first, first go? I realise we're up against the four o'clock time, so um, we'll we'll pick up at the start of the next session with the um, with you know selection. So that's the the kind of thing to think about before the next session is which areas of the business are you going to focus focus this work on. As I say, it's not a definitive answer at this stage. It's just to get you to start to think about those things. Um, so we've got a couple of ideas for some cert from certain people, um, but. Uh, we'll pick that up at the start of the next session.